Okay, so thanks for coming out for the third string uh, speaker. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to, uh, Father, I ask that you, uh, you know, give me wisdom in this, circum in this situation. Help me to say, um, give this message in the right structure, um, in the right spirit, and I ask that uh, those here be blessed by what I, what I share in the name of Yeshua. Because I'm going to be on the same ride you are. Um, I usually like to prepare better than this, but I, I, I put it on my schedule Monday to start, and then I got busy, and I had to keep pushing it back. So I, my style is I like to write my thoughts down, get the basic structure, and then walk away, right? Go to sleep, whatever, wake up the next day, come back and say to myself, what was I thinking? You know, let's <laughs> take this out, I'll take that. You know, how about add this? So you guys are going to get first draft, so I apologize um, if I'm going to be a little <laughs> all over the place. Um, what's interesting is I really like this last song, and I think it touched upon something, because I didn't really title this message. I like to title my messages, but I have to say that I think that last song, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, I think that's going to be my title. But what my first slide is, and again, I usually time myself, so I'm going to try to watch the clock. Um, where, where did the ancients get their wisdom? So what's interesting is, I like, as you know, I like to listen to Dennis Prager. And if you know, Dennis Prager is a Jewish guy, and he has great respect for the Christian religion. But he won't quite admit uh, that he believes, but you know, he, he, he has great respect. And I think I jumped in the car, and I would usually have it on if I'm in the car. And someone called up and said to him, and I, because he, he always has an hour on religion or something, on God or something. And I missed what came before it. But what the guy asked, right, who I have a guest ask, and the guest asked, where did the ancients get their wisdom? And Dennis Prager's answer, again, he, he's a very big believer in God from the uh, Jewish perspective. I felt his answer was a little weak because what he, and again, no one has all the answers. I don't have all the answers, but I felt like I have the answer. I wish I could call in right now. But part of it was, and what Dennis Prager would admit, and I think we could all admit, is that um, there could be wisdom. Technically, there could be a, an element of wisdom outside of the biblical tradition, outside of who God is, right? There is a, 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 a you know, people, there's people out there who aren't believers that live decent, good lives, right? They have wisdom, they discernment, they know. But this guy was wanting to know outside, but, but so Dennis went back to the Bible and kind of talked about that, and, and he kind of danced around it a little bit. I'm going to give you the answer because I have the answer. But at the end, but I just want to put this in your head. So my, my speak is going to go, is if you remember, if you were at my last talk, and I just want to highlight this because I am going to get into this because this is the big element of our day that the battle, what we're doing is, you know, the difference between men and women. And just to highlight, and if you have it, if you want to hear this message, Pat has it saved somewhere so you could hear it. He's recorded the message. It was actually pretty mind blowing to me when I came, when this, and I feel like God, like I said, he just dropped it in my mind as a complete thought in the middle of the night. And it really just uh, shook me on how many dots it connected. But just to summarize, just to kind of get this back in your, in your head, um, is that men, <clears throat> men, their nature and purpose is love, but they desire wisdom. And women's nature and purpose is wisdom, but they desire love. And so the element is, you could see the lower parts are the, the issues we deal with, right? Everyone likes, you know, we all, men and women have their issues that they struggle with. Men, lust, women, foolishness. There is emotion, responsibility, but ultimately, at their greatest self, men will love and women will embody wisdom. So really, I just have need, men need to learn to embrace and cultivate their own nature of love and what it means to, to, to commit to a woman. And women need to learn to embrace and cultivate their own nature of wisdom to make better decisions and draw men towards ambition and away from lust. So what I'm going to start going into, and so if you know, you know, if you look at the three different styles between uh, Sam, Mitch, and myself, you know, Sam, you know, very spiritual person, very focused on the spirit. Um, Mitch is very into evangelism and, and sharing the word. 
I'm the guy that wants to get in under the hood and, and start tinkering with what's down there. <clears throat> so I'm going to start talking about, we're going to explore basically this concept, which we're all aware of in Ecclesiastes, right? What has been done is what will be, and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So what is, the, you know, the, so when we talk about the, the wisdom of the ancients, you know, how do they know this stuff, right? right? Why does the Bible say in the Old Testament, men don't dress like women, women don't dress like, was that a problem back then? Well, obviously it was if it had to be addressed. And so those are things we're still struggling with today. But why? People don't understand why, why you know, why is that? See, people think we're, and, and you, could, you could see it in today's, in today's philosophy. We're evolving as a species, right? Evolution. We're evolving. So part of men, women becoming men and men becoming women is just natural evolution, right? We're getting more sophisticated but we're really just stuck in the same loop, vicious loop, uh, that we've always been in. <clears throat> so it's interesting dynamic. And when I have Greek here, so in Judeo-Christianity, man is made in God's image. In Greek religion, God is made in man's image. When I said Greek, I'm gonna, we're going to start exploring some art history here. Because how do we know what the ancients were doing, what they were thinking, right? A lot of it comes from what we dig out of the ground whether it's art, writings, tablets, whatever they can figure out. But, you know, was it anthropologists and psychologists, they like to talk about archetypes, right? That people fall into these certain archetypes, and there's these certain paths and grooves, right? And I think biblically, people will talk about the spirit of, right? It's almost like an archetype, the spirit of, of you know, certain, you know, when you're, when you're worshiping pagan gods, there's these spirits that come with it, whether it be of lust or of greed or of whatever. There's these, these spirits. And so these are things that people just keep finding themselves looped back into. Um, and so the idea is that other religions make God in their own image because it gives people permission. It's that people giving themselves permission to fully express the unhealthy sides of, of, of the flesh, ultimately. So again, with me, if you know me, I like to do painting. So we're going to go through some art lessons here. So we're going to start at the beginning. So here's some of the ancients that they dug up out of the ground. And so um, you can see this is from ancient Sumerians and Assyrians, right, way back. And what's interesting, and I'm going to plant this seed as well, and this is a question, is people say, if they look across the world at the different religions around the world, going even to the, eight, to, to, to the far east, to the American Indians, right? They see, they see patterns, they see similarities in some aspects of how they worship, what they worship, right? There's these angles. And so th there's two ways, there's two options that, that, and I think the second option circles back to the first. The first option is, is that everyone because right with American Indians, if you've ever looked at that, there's traditions around the American in Indians, the way they did certain traditions that people actually would think they're one of the lost tribes of Israel. There were some similarities in maybe the, the tzitzits or some other things. And either all religions came from a single source, and so those similarities echoed out, and as people changed, they kept some of those things, or they all independently developed you know, similarities independently, right? The reason why we, number two points back to one is because if we all come from a single creator, then obviously he created those elements within each individual to go back to these certain types of, of, of uh, areas of, of what, what it is uh, spiritually and what it means to connect to the heavenlies. So here we are, we have these statues and carvings, and you can see here is the, they look like they're either, their hands are folded in prayer, but there's these bearded men, and then there's these women, and then here's this, you know, rough, tough, bearded guy that's fighting off some, some, you know, fierce creature. And then we move, you know, a little bit further, and we get into the Mesopotamian and Babylonian, right? So again, you have these, you know, structured, bearded, you know, pillars of, of, of you know, strength, you know, foundation. And again, part of it is that their skills obviously were still improving. Actually, if anyone knows about this, they say this rock is so hard, they're not even sure how they carve that. Um, but, you know, that's pretty impressive. 
We're going to move up a little further. We're going to go to, uh, this is basically like ancient Greece. So this is Dionysus. He is the god of the grape harvest, wine making, orchards and fruit, vegetation, fertility, festivity, insanity, ritual madness, religious ecstasy, and theater. Um, the Romans called him Bacchus. So he's really the one that, you know, that, again, this is one of the gods that allows people to sort of uh, go after their fleshly desires. Um, but you could see here early on, he's a bearded guy with a, you know, cup of wine. And here in the third century, he's holding this, what's called a uh, thrysis, I think it's called. It's a wander staff covered with ivy, vines, and leaves, sometimes topped with a pine cone or artichoke. And it resembles a symbol of prosperity, fertility, and hedonism. It's funny that they, they uh, put hedonism in they, along with prosperity. Um, obviously, with hedonism, it's like the desire to increase pleasure and decrease pain. But you could see here, he's this bearded guy that's, you know, in ancient Greece. But what's interesting about humans, in each generation, and this is what's the interesting dynamic, you know, not only are we cyclical in that nothing is new under the sun, but it does follow these generational patterns, and you've heard me talk about that before. And in just a few generations, and even God, he talks about curses and blessings across generations. Why is that, right? It, it, it's because God doesn't just always throw the lightning bolt right as soon as you do something wrong. It, your wrong has to play out. Um, and, and, that, and that's just sort of the nature of things. And so it, the struggle of each generation is to basically, it's almost like every generation wants to be unique from its parents, right? There's this dynamic between the child and the parent. And believe me, I've always kept my eye on it with my own kids, right? Is the idea that they want to be seen as different, you know, are your ways old? Like how do you convince them of something <laughs> that's beneficial and how do you say to them, this is what's really a value, and here's where you can go and take things and, and, and make it your own, right? And I think there's a lot of people out there that don't understand, you know, parents get so um, um, just intense to their children. It's almost like, you, you know, you have to do these things. There's like almost a controlling factor. And it almost can blow up on you, right? Because now it's... Um, you know, you're forcing this on me, or I don't agree with, you know, you, I guess, again, there is, I'm not a perfect parent, no one's, a, it's just, that's what you juggle, right? You're trying to say to them, here's what's a value, and here's where you are independent and what you can be your own person. So there's that desire. So if you look at the rebellion of each generation, right, even to the 20s, right, the flappers and those people during the, you know, who liked, uh, what is it, the, the great Gatsby, the partiers, right, you stuffy old parents, you know, blah, 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 and then they eventually came kind of the stuffy old parents, and then the boomers come up and said, ah, you stuffy old parents, blah, 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 and then, of course, you think the boomers, the hippest generation out there, and then their kids are like, ah, you stuffy old parents, we're going to push this envelope even further, and then it, got, it just progressively gets worse. But anyway, so if we look at Dionysus here, here's what happens, and this is where we're going to get into the transgender type thing. So he becomes effeminate. And so what's interesting is everyone thinks, oh boy, you know, girls becoming boys and boys becoming girls. You know, we're evolving. <laughs> it's always been here in art. And again, I have the fig leaves, obviously, to keep things good. And I, I pray I got all the fig leaves in this presentation. <laughs> but you get the point. So the idea that art, even today, is the cutting edge expression of that sort of that deeper level of philosophy where it goes. Art tends to lead the way, right? And even if you look at art in the uh, 20th century where they went from that classical realism into the abstract, right? And it really dovetailed with the theory of, um, you know, what, what came out of Nietzsche, right? God is dead and the idea of, you know, we don't need God and there's this humanistic and the ideas of evolution and, and Einstein's theory of relativity, right? Things are relative, right? So that started, that art started to reflect first and, and, and change and like crush those, those boundaries and then the generations followed because yeah, you're right, you push that envelope, now I can push it further. But here you can see he's become effeminate and what's also interesting is you see the curves of the body, right? It, he, there, he's not that masculine. So you're seeing this in the artwork, and then also with, this is uh, Venus de Milo, right? 
150 BC, the drapery around the waist, and they're doing the same thing with Dionysus. So they've kind of feminized him. And so, um, actually this is, uh, even though it's a Venus de Milo, the statue is of Aphrodite, who's the uh, associated with love, lust, beauty, pleasure, and passion. So you can see where they're pulling Dionysus in that direction. Again, because this god was made in the image of man, they dragged Dionysus towards whatever flavor of, of hedonism they wanted, right? And so an art reflected that. Um, Aphrodite was worshipped as a warrior goddess. She was the patron goddess of prostitutes, an association which led early scholars to propose the concept of sacred prostitution. And what's interesting is how a goddess a warrior goddess is associated to prostitution, right? So again, if you look at today's culture where the, f the modern feminist movement is nothing, has very little to do with being feminine at this point, it's really about, you know, this, they wanna be sort of that warrior class. And it's interesting that prostitution is associated with that dynamic, they go hand in hand. When the woman is looking to sort of show that masculine trait, then, prostitution is as a result. So there's that, the, the, that dynamic. Um, and just one note uh, with this statue is that it wasn't until about 370 BC that the naked female figure appeared in sculpture in ancient Greece, right? And then, but male nudes appeared earlier around 447 BC. So again, it's that idea of where did that start to transition, right? And it's always gradual and each generation wants to take it a step further than the next. Here's just some examples of earlier male sculptures that are just very kind of traditional, right? The guy is, uh, you know, that's why the difference between the curvy stance to make their figures look feminine, right? The, the hands, the hips, which you could see with modern homosexuality, right? They like to flaunt that way. And again, they're not flaunting any different than the ancients. They're just playing that, the same scenario out. But here, very stiff, structured, um, just, you know, masculinity. And then here's just, so before it was just men, and here's just some got people, I don't know who they are. But again, over time, you, so you, what you'll see, and, and it kind of, and it's a pendulum, everything's a pendulum. One generation basically says, you're too stuffy, we need to free ourselves of that. And then a couple generations later, it, goes, it gets so chaotic that a generation rises up and says, oh my gosh, we are living in chaos, we need structure. <laughs> And then they create structure, and then that's the cycle. But of course, everything overplays itself, both the structure and, and the chaos. And so when you get, that's where you get sort of the, there's the, I, I've talked about before, and I know if anyone's listened to Jordan Peterson, he, he likes to highlight those as well, is the uh, tyrannical father and the devouring mother, right? So the tyrannical father wants complete control. So that is the, the pendulum of, that structure, it gets so rigid because as time you wanna make it more and more rigid, it's just human nature. Again, it's a dysfunction, but it is what it is, and everyone plays it out, and then it, it, someone wants to break free of it. Here's uh, Artemis, this is an Olympic goddess of the hunt, the moon, chastity, and then in time she became associated with childbirth and nature. And just the idea that this is the masculine expression of the feminine back then, right? She's the huntress, uh, clothed. She, she, you could see her stance, right? Where the guys were very curvy and like this, she's very structured, strength. Her feet are anchored. She's, you know, in her, in her security of the hunt, right? She's drawing her bow. So those are just all power. And again, <laughs> incredible you know, talent there for sure in the movement of the cloth, you know, if we get into artistic analysis. But again, that's the, you know, the, the other dynamic. So again, what's interesting is what you can see out of the human heart, right, is how they express it in their artwork and how they express it in their culture. And so one of the things we'll talk about, again, when you come out with Artemis, but is the, the Amazons, right? Now, Amazons, no, I, they don't think they're true, but it's basically legend. But that, again, that's a story, that's a myth that comes out of the heart. 
And so if we look at the attributes of the, the Amazons, right, it was said to be a tribe of independent, mighty women who have rebelled against the men-dominated society. They live in isolated places, exclude men from their society, and make war against them. While still a girl, the right breast would be cauterized using a searing hot bronze tool. It was thought to remove all possible hindrances to the using of the spear or drawing an arrow. These women were more in tune with warfare than feminism, were not allowed to get married because it was thought to be a kind of slavery to a man. Now basically we just listed the, <laughs> the credence of modern feminism, right? So again, they're literally playing out an ancient uh, scenario. There's, they, if anything, you wanna say, why don't you come up with something original? Um, so, and again, and, it's, and again, we're in that moment, right, where people are, young girls are cutting off their breasts. And so I think this was legend because it was the desire of the heart to achieve that. And I think it was also interesting if you looked at, when I, and if you go get back to my lecture, when men are love and women are wisdom, right, there is no legend of a man society without women, but there is the legend of a woman society without the man. And so I, I think men, you know, long for women in that loving relationship more where women are thinking, well, it's, again, it's a wisdom thing. Society would be better if we could get rid of men. So that's almost like a wisdom, even though it's foolishness, but it's that, it's that process. Um, and so, so that's the Amazons, okay? So that's, again, a legend that's born of the heart, the desire. So I wanna show, uh, uh, the next slide is gonna be our modern Amazon. But what's interesting about this and why I'm showing is, is let's look at how our Amazonian, uh, Amazonian hero changed within 100 years. How many generations? So you went from the pose looking, you know, with a skirt, has a lot of feminine qualities. And they were trying to find that balance, which is fair. I mean, you want that, a strong woman, an independent, right? A woman who's sure of herself. I don't think anyone does not want that. And so that's what they were looking to achieve. And then in time when we get to uh, good old Linda Carter, right? There was still that element of femininity, strong, you know what I mean? And, and all she has is her wristbands and her rope, right? And a lot of it was just her strength and then the idea of the rope, you know, having some people tell the truth. And now we've gone to this hyper-masculinized version. Now again, I like Gal Gadot. She's Israeli, it takes an Israeli to really pull off a strong Wonder Woman, right? So we gotta give her credit there. And she's playing her role, but that's, this is, you know, within a few generations, this is, generations that are, I mean, technically alive today. I mean, they're at their, the, the end, but, right? This is within a lifespan. So that just shows you that. Let's look at how this same scenario played out in the past. These are all statues of David, our biblical hero, right? <clears throat> so what's interesting is in 1440s, a very feminine David, you know, he's got the feminine poses, he's got the hat with flowers on it, you know, obviously he's an expression of that art. And then within what, another 30 some years, you get uh, the David from Verrocchio or Verrocchio, right? Again, feminized, youthful boy, you know, not quite masculine. And then what, another 25 years, whatever, now we got our masterpiece, Michelangelo, getting back to manliness, strength, power, right? So again, it's all part of the cycle. But you can see, again, just like Wonder Woman, within a few generations, you're seeing, and again, and it'll, it'll swing back, right? When we go from here, it will swing back. So again, we're all part of the pendulum. That's why it's really understanding how the pendulum swings and where we are at in our lifetime on that pendulum. And I think a lot of what God is looking for is rising to your occasion, right? Life is tougher in the day we're in. To be a godly person is harder now than it was in the 40s and 50s when religion was more part of our, our culture, right? And so we all have our struggles, but, um, but that's part of uh, th th that. So this, again, what, another 25 years or so, I don't know, longer, David from a, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce Bernini. Um, that, now see, that is what good sculpture should look like. Number one, 
masculine. Number two, movement, right? In, 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 in sculpture, right, when we looked at the Sumerians, they're all like this. But this is literally art and beauty to the max. He's got strength, he's got power, he's covered up. <laughs> this was uh, commissioned by a cardinal. And what's interesting is the expression on his face. And look at the tension on that. Um, and that's marble. Isn't that amazing? So that is where you can appreciate uh, sculpture, right? That I, I almost like this David better than Michael, you know, um, Michelangelo's because it just it has much more expression and energy and movement and just passion in the face and determination to conquer, right? Masculine qualities. And then here we are with what they're playing today, same game. I mean, they made statues of, uh, you know, her, Hermaphroditus, right? And so Hermaphroditus was uh, uh, the son of Hermes, a messenger of the gods, and Aphrodite, a goddess of love. Hermaphroditus had inherited the beauty of both his parents and was brought up by the nymphs of Mount Ida. At the age of 15, he grew bored with his surroundings. Sounds like, you know, modern teenagers. Um, and traveled to the cities of Lycia and Caria. Am I reading that right? Oh, um, okay, I didn't have it. Um, it was in the woods of Caria that he encountered the nymph Salmasis in her pool. She was overcome by lust for the boy who was very handsome but still young and tried to seduce him but was rejected. When he thought her to be gone, he undressed and entered the waters of the pool and Salamasis sprang out from behind a tree, jumped into the pool, wrapped herself around the boy, forcibly kissing him while he struggled and she called out to the gods that they should never part. Her wish was granted and their bodies blended into one form, a creation of both sexes, a person with the figure of, uh, with breasts of a woman and the organ of a man. So again, this is the same playbook we're seeing today um, that just played out in the past. What concerns me more so, though, is one thing we do not know is how, perme how much it permeated the culture. I think I shared with you, and I can't remember, and I see again, I, I didn't prepare well enough. I, I, there was a time when I said um, in Greece that marriage had fallen out of favor, right? And we're seeing it today. Less and less people are getting married. It got to the point, so the priest of, uh, oh, why am I going blank? Um, a priest of, uh, I don't know, one of the priests of one of the gods, and it'll come to me. Um, one of their criteria was that the priest had to be the child of an intact marriage, a husband and a wife that were married. For 70 years, they could not fill that position because they could not find a man whose parents were still intact, and that people just didn't get married, they just, you know, just like today, we move in together and we have kids, there is no marriage. And so there was that 70 year gap, and we're seeing that play out today, same thing. And so what I'm adding here, and again, this might be part of my scatteredness, which I wish I prepared better. This is 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. If, if men today, if we replace the word child with woman, which we're doing for men, we're emasculating them, if they start to, to speak like a woman and think like a woman and reason like a woman, when I, they would not become a man, right? So what damage would that do? The idea of what God wants men to be is men and, and put away childish things and gain that responsibility to achieve that wisdom and a wisdom that women can help them achieve. So where are we at today, right? Here, I think we're really here, right? Because it says in Ezekiel, you rebelled against my ordinance by doing wickedness worse than the nations. And we're starting, I mean, if you look at Europe with a lot of the, what's going on today with a lot of this transgender and, and, and wokeness, Europe's almost looking at America saying, okay, you, you're taking it a little bit too far. And what's interesting is when God blesses, I mean, we've been so blessed as a nation. And I know Israel is the same way. They must have been so blessed that a generation that rises up with that blessing is basically like, why do I need God anymore? Because everything's handed to me, right? And that's kind of where we're at today. And the idea of that because of your, you know, 
you know, I put you in the midst of nations with countries all around her, and she had rebelled against my ordinances, doing wickedness worse in the nations, and against my decrees worse in the surrounding countries, for they have rejected my ordinances, and as for my decrees, they have not walked in them. And then he talks about how he's gonna really make life uncomfortable with them, very uncomfortable, right? And because they defiled my sanctuary with all their detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will shave you off. My eye will not spare, and I will have no pity. A third of you will die in the plague and will be consumed with famine in your midst, and a third will fall by the sword, and a third will be scattered to the, the winds and, and draw out a sword after them. And the veil of my anger. So, you know, will not be satisfied. So, you know, the idea that this is God's nature, right? And, and, People are bringing it upon themselves. So it's really just the reaction to how people are responding. And so this is where I come back to this, if you remember my last um, talk, is the idea that this is the, 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 the structure, right? Mass, love comes down, but wisdom is basically submission, and love is the response to that. And Yeshua, in his submission to God, so that's why everyone's like, well, there's all these genders, blah, blah, blah. Well, there are like masculine and female traits. If you look at the Latin languages, right, like Spanish, Italian, they end in A's or end in O's. It's a masculine word. It's a feminine word. Why is the word for boat? Why do people talk, call boats or ships her, she, whatever it is, right? So there are elements of that in a spiritual sense, but they, they have their lanes, So the submission of Yeshua to God, right? He says, therefore Yeshua answered him, amen, amen, I tell you, the son cannot do anything by himself. That's ultimate submission. Literally, I can't even do it my, anything myself. He can do only what he sees the father doing. Whether, whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he does. The father loves the son in that submission, that, that female submission, the masculine love comes down, and it creates this dynamic, this relationship. And then it says, um, you know, he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raised the dead and give them life, and also the son gives life to whomever he wants, the father does not judge, you know, but it's been handed over to the son that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. And then further down, I can do nothing on my own, just as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, for I do not seek my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. So if I cannot do anything on my own. Is he a prisoner? Is he? I don't know. I mean, people could argue he would be, but he's not, because there's this dynamic where he's given greater authority. So again, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And now let's explore that, because Yeshua is be given authority and given power through that love. And that's what I like about this, is that love is the transaction, is the ultimate transaction. <clears throat> Here we are again, Yeshua submitting to earthly authorities. When Pilate heard the word, he became even more fearful. He went into the praetorium again and said to Yeshua, where are you from? But Yeshua gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you aren't speaking to me. Don't you know I have the authority to release you, and I have the authority to crucify you. And then Yeshua answered, you would have no authority over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Think about this. So Yeshua's first work, I submit to you, was a feminine work. It was a work of submission. He submitted to the authorities of this world. The, the Messiah, the creator God, who had all authority and power, is on his knees before a heathen, pagan magistrate, not even Caesar, but a magistrate, and he submitted himself to that, and he submitted unto death, okay? That is ultimate, ultimate submission. And, but again, it's a feminine act, but that's why the dynamic, right, is um, when he comes back, it will be in a masculine work. But in his feminine work, when he came in submission, in fem it w from the female comes what? Life. What did he give birth to? The church. So in his feminine work, he left and he gave, it gave birth to what we are today. And when he comes back, it's going to be more masculine. And it will be more of a, 
um, a, a structure. But what I think that God is looking for, why are we even in this predicament, right? The world, and why is it a fallen world? Because God wants, and Yeshua wants, he doesn't want to force people to do anything. He wants, he's going to collect those that said, I submitted, I, I agree with what you're doing, I love, I give, right? He, then there's no fighting, there's no bickering, there's no problems, right? He, he, everyone who's there wants to be there. And so that is love, right? If you don't want to be there, I mean, we all have that choice. <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to try to circle back. Here we go. Oh, and the, here my other note is we all, so to some say, some of, well, I don't want to submit. Yeshua shouldn't submit to God. Men shouldn't submit to Yeshua. Women shouldn't submit to men. And children should, shouldn't submit to their parents, right? We all submit to something. And we either submit in the direction towards God or we submit to our own desires, right? And that's what really keeps us stuck in this world. And so here's where, okay, is there beauty in submission? And this is where I guess I should have used the word freedom. Maybe if I'd have come back and slept on it, I would have. But where the spirit of the Lord freedom is. So let's talk about beauty and freedom. Is there beauty in submission? Is there freedom? I, I like freedom better, so I might rewrite that. Okay, aesthetics, what is that, right? It's a set principles concerning, concerned with the nature and appreciation of beauty, especially in art. So what are some of the conditions of, 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 for the presentation of beauty in art? Skillful execution, composition, color, form, representation, artistic expression. Today, modern art, and if you go, actually Dennis Prager had a guy who did a, uh, he has two videos. One is why is classic art beautiful or good, and why is modern art garbage? And, you know, in the old days, artists learned a craft, and it took years of study and discipline and practice to learn that craft. And that's why you see a lot of the classic paintings are very beautiful. But what's interesting is here's these points. These are structures. These are guide rails. If you follow those guide rails, and again, this is just a montage, whatever, a collage. How many works of beauty and art come out of those guide rails, right? Endless. I mean, this is just the tip. Of the, I mean, I'm just randomly picking art, right? Beautiful things can come out of those boundaries. Let's look at music. It's nothing but a, uh, an intri intricate architecture combination of five parameters or elements. Sound, rhythm, melody, harmony, and growth. Structure. From that structure, you can write so much great music. And you can tell horrible music because it doesn't have those elements. So those guide rails, right? It's this. This is where the freedom is. Because if you can, if you adhere and you learn the guide rails, then you actually have ultimate freedom. And what do you have ultimate freedom from? Yourself, right? We're all on this planet trying to get over ourselves, right? We're trying to improve ourselves, get out of our own way. How do we, you know, draw closer to God so that we get that, that dynamic of influence and power and favor in who God is? And that's where I think beauty and freedom comes through that structure. So everyone's like, I don't need your rules. I don't need, you know, the Torah is our structure. I don't need that. That's, that, that, that's just crushing on me. But if you don't have that, what are we getting? If you look at art today and you look at what people are doing to their bodies and you could look at just all the fat, it just looks horrendous. It really does. It's chaos. And at some point, a generation is going to rise up and say, all right, we got to get back to something a little bit better. All right. So let's ask the question, where did their ancients get their wisdom from? Let's look at the Ten Commandments and you're going to see I have a dotted line. Here's what, you know, so the dotted line is basically a lot of, of uh, cultures that follow what's below that dotted line succeed, roughly, generally speaking. If you look at all the nations that conquered other nations, Rome, Babylon, anybody, I mean, Alexander the Great, in those generations and in those times, they were very strict in their adherence to that bottom quadrant. Marriage was very important. They didn't let divorce, like all of that. That was where it was very draconian. And if you look at those things, uh, even of the 1800s, right, the 19th century America, when we exploded on, on the world stage as a great power from the blessings of God because we added that top portion. But Babylon, 
all of this, if you look at their rules and their tablets, they were very strict. But then in time, when they had success, generations rose up, didn't have to fight anyone, and they become, uh, they started, like anybody else, they loosened up, and the same thing happened to Rome. And again, I'm showing you the artwork, because you could see it in the artwork, where they started to loosen up their values. So here's why the ancients were wise. Because back then, everyone was a microcosm, right? They were multiple tribes. And, you, and so when a tribe would adhere to a certain aspect of life and it weakened them, a stronger one would come over and conquer it. And they're like, oh, wow, look. If the men over there started to dress like women and these brutes saw weakness, they take them over. Interesting. Here, there's a tribe over here that dresses like women. And there's some brutes over there. Oh, oh, they conquer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, let's not, maybe there's something to it, right? So I think what we're happening is, is we're so locked in to the, I mean, again, and, and Elon Musk touched upon it, right? If, if anyone saw in the news lately, he said to the World Economic Forum or whoever he was talking to, he said, I don't know if one world government is a good idea because if we put all our eggs in one basket and that one government falls, we will lose civilization. And it's the same thing with the United States. Each state was supposed to be its own microcosm, doing the best it could. And then if one state fell, the other states would support it and say, this is what's working for us. Why don't you adopt this? But we're not going to force you to adopt it. So the more we go to this central federalized system, if we all put our eggs in that basket and it falls, we're all going to fall. And I think we're actually you know, dancing around that. So hopefully we can get out of that. But that's really what it is. The wisdom of the ancients saw a more quicker dynamic of what that behavior did. And the same thing with the traders. If, they, if you hear about, you know, as, as England or other countries, they, when they started traveling the world in ships, they would come across tribes. They would write notes. They would say, oh, this tribe has these attributes, or they, this tribe has this attribute. They would say, one tribe is very into their gods and religion. And, and when someone is sick, they pray to that God to that, that that person gets well. And then they leave, and then another person comes back maybe another 50 years later, and they say, oh, wow, look, when someone's sick, they take roots, and they make a potion, and they feed them. It becomes scientific, or they rub this on the wound, right? So, oh, they, they let go of the religion. They got back to science. And then they would leave, and then another 20, 30, 40, 50 years, they come back, and then they would say, oh, look, they're wearing charms around their necks so that their people don't. So, again, they even saw it then. So when you have these microcosms of, of, of tribes and you get to see how things play out, that is really outside of the Bible, which, again, I, th I believe that all the obviously God is that central source because you can see the echo of, of what, who God is in other religions. And that's why people are like, well, maybe we all have the same God. No, 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 you're really confusing the echo. And again, by their fruits you shall know them. If you really look closely... God has been in control this whole time, and anyone who's adhered to these principles has really um, um, seen success like no other. But the sad thing is, is that success breeds generations that say, um, you know, I, there is no God because life's too easy, and I don't need God. Um, so I'll just end with this, right, for, for, the, for the nations. Uh, if you listen... Now, if you listen obediently to the voice of Adonai, your God, taking care to do all his mitzvot that I'm commanding you today... Adonai, your God, will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. Then these blessings will come upon you and overtake you, which is incredible, uh, if you listen to the voice of Adonai. Then it talks about all the ways that he blesses people. But that's ultimately it. If you follow the bottom half, you will overtake a nation that had God and crumbled. But if, you add, but if that nation, if a generation that gets conquered adds that top half back, you get this. And again, that's the cycle, and we're in that cycle now. So no one's doing anything new, no one's doing anything different, and we're all heading in a world of pain. And it's sad because it's, there's a lot of, you know, again, drug usage, uh, suicides, depressions are up. It's, not, it's correlated, right? There's, it's not, there's no mystery here. So anyway, that's my message. Um, I guess we can stand for the...
say the ironic blessing together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat. Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shabbat, Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. <laughs>